Hello, everyone. Welcome to Masters Tuesday. And we have three students who will be graduating. The day is going to be uh, chaired by graduate student Eric Hyatt. So I'll turn my mute mic. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Masters Tuesday. My name is Eric Hyatt, and I'm your student chair today. Now let's get started. Uh, please remember that each talk is going to be 15 minutes in length. Um, our first speaker is going to be Colton Spears. Uh, he's going to be introduced by Dr. Robert Laux. I'd like to introduce Colton Spears. Colton entered graduate school here at the University of Texas in all, um, here at Austin in August 2018. For his undergraduate degree, he first attended Brookhaven College in Dallas, Texas. And then he transferred to Hardin Simmons University in Abilene, where he received his BS in Geological Sciences in December 2017. Xavier Jansen and I are his co supervisors. His thesis topic is a geologic characterization of a lower Cretaceous oil field in East Texas. Go ahead, Colton. Hello, everybody. Uh... Thank you, Bob, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining in to hear about our research. Uh, the title of my thesis is Analysis of the Depositional Systems, Lithophases, Diagenesis, and Reservoir Quality of the Lower Cretaceous Pettit Limestone Reservoir Section in the Wright Mountain Field in the East Texas Basin. Colton, I hate to interrupt, Colton, but if you could uh, swap your screens, we can see the, the presenter view. Gotcha. Looks great, thank you. All right. The Pettit limestone is lowermost Aptian in age according to the Phelps et al. 2013 stratigraphic column. According to Bouchard, 1969 and Phelps, the, pet, the Pettit strata is an overall succession of carbonates transgressing across continental to shallow marine silica classics. However, within the Pettit limestone transgressive system, there appears to be several higher order frequency cycles based on core lithophases analysis, probable fourth or fifth order cycles. The East Texas Basin is an intra-shelf salt withdrawal basin. That being said, areas within the East Texas Basin as well as surrounding areas have been affected by late salt movement creating highs. But according to maps by Cine and Jackson, 1983, no salt diapirs are in the immediate area of the Wright Mountain Field. The Wright Mountain Field is located on the northeast margin of the East Texas Basin in Smith County, Texas. Several older regional studies in the area suggest that the carbonate Pettit limestone section in the Wright Mountain Field was deposited on a shallow water shelf favorable to carbonate production. Internally, the Pettit limestone contains three coarsening upward cycles, which I've labeled Pettit A, B, and C. However, the Pettit A cycle was not cored. Wiggins and Harris, 1984, investigated the Pettit limestone in adjacent Rust County and found similar cyclical stratigraphication. Approximately 160 wells with wireline logs were correlated in a Petra project to help create structure and isopack maps of the Pettit limestone. The right mountain field is outlined in the middle and right figures by a dashed red box. The middle figure is, is a structure map of the top of the Pettit limestone. Cooler colors represent structurally low areas, whereas warmer colors indicate highs. The right mountain field is located in a structurally low area with higher elevated areas to the northeast and southwest. The map on the right is an isopack map of the Pettit B carbonate unit. The cooler colors represent thinner areas of the unit. According to the maps, not only is the right mountain field in a structurally low area, but it also shows to be relatively thin. If it is interpreted that the thicker areas are carbonate buildups, such as, such as shoaling locations, the isopack map shows the right mountain field being just lateral of such an area. Lithophases analysis of the Pettit limestone in the right mountain field helps solidify this idea. Six core were analyzed and logged for rock fabric, mineral composition, and textural components. The Edna B. Smith number one and three were used as type cores for the investigation. The spontaneous potential wireline curve is a portion of the Edna B. Smith number three wireline log which is used here to show differences in argillaceous abundance throughout the cord Pettit C and B sections. Note that the SB curve is more negative at the top of both of the Pettit B and C cycles, indicating a reduction in argillaceous material. The higher SP is interpreted to be the beginning of a higher frequency cycle, 
and is seen easily at the base of the Pettit B cycle. Lithophases of the Pettit section range from calcareous siliciclastic rich mudstones to baroteolitic grainstones. Allochems include ooids, peloids, mollusks, and oyster fragments, milliolid foraminifers, gastropods, echinoids, and green algae. These lithophases are representative of lower energy, deeper water deposits found towards the bottom of the Pettit cycles. The high percentage of siliciclastic material composed predominantly of clay minerals, minimal amounts of biota, and lack of ooids suggest this lithophases was deposited in deeper water when the ooid factory was not present or was further up dip. Bottom waters were probably somewhat stressed and inhibited biotas. Minor occurrences of laminae are present, but the general lack of laminae indicates burrowing in an oxygenated setting that was possibly dysaerobic. Top lithophases is a green algal bivalve packstone and makes up most of the mid cycle lithophases. This lithophases is interpreted to have been deposited in a shallower water setting than the previous two lithophases. The amount of biota grains preserved as packstone to some grainstone indicates a healthy carbonate factory present in the area. The few ooids identified suggest that a higher energy shoaling system was active, but had little effect on the immediate area. The, the depositional setting for this lithophases may have been a green algal meadow with moderate wave and current energy. The bottom lithophases is a burrowed oolitic packstone to grainstone. The dominance of ooid coated grains with subtle cross bedding indicates a higher energy depositional setting than seen in the other lithophases. However, the bioturbation indicates a stable enough setting where burrows could live and their traces preserved. This setting is interpreted as being some distance from the flank of active ooid shoaling sands. The facies is predominantly a grainstone, but can contain up to 40% carbonate mud. Shell lag deposits and thin, less than one millimeter mud layers are common and are interpreted as storm-induced sediment flows off of a shoal flank rather than deposition within an active ooid shoal. The burrowed oolitic packstone to grainstone has the best reservoir quality with mean porosity of 5.8% and a mean permeability of 2.4 millidarcy. Pores are predominantly primary interparticle and secondary molding. Wiggins and Harris, 1984, postulated that the Pettit A, B, and C units are shoaling upward cycles, with the top of each cycle being an ooid shoal complex. However, in the Pettit B and Pettit C units in the right mountain field, it doesn't appear to be this simple. The units in the right mountain field do appear to shoal up, but not necessarily in the shoal water complexes. To develop a depositional model for the Pettit B and Pettit C units, two major observations must be addressed. First is the general shoaling stacking pattern, i.e. upward decrease in carbonate mud and upward increase in higher energy lithophases within the cycle. And second, an explanation of the observed combination of allochems and texture within the lithophases. Evidence for this lower energy inner shoal area is the allochem mixtures and fabric of the lithophases. The mixture of ooids and more fragile grain types, such as thin mollusk shells and green algal plates, suggests that they did not form in the same environment, but were mixed together by transport. Also, the grains associated with the ooids show no superficial ooid coatings, which would be expected on the majority of grains. Storm transport off the shoal complex is the most likely process for this resedimentation. The major process that produced the fabric of the Pettit limestone lithophases was bioturbation. Sedimentary features such as cross bedding that would be expected in ooid shoals is not common in the Pettit B and C units. The oxygenated bottom waters allowed abundant bioturbation to develop. Therefore, the lack of sedimentary features is consistent with the final depositional setting, not strongly affected by waves and currents, except probably during major storms. It is interpreted that during higher energy storm events, carbonate material was transported from the shoal complex into deeper water areas surrounding the shoal. The transport mechanisms are interpreted to be gravity flows initiated by storm waves and currents and possible associated mud plume that settled out into the deeper water areas following the storms. Hawk pyrolysis analysis of the organic material matter was conducted on 40 samples to characterize the abundance and source rock richness of the Pettit limestone and Travis Peak units in the Wright Mountain field. Overall, the abundance of TOC is low, ranging from 0.30 to 0.47 weight percent TOC. 
This low amount of TOC fits with the Pettit limestone and Travis Peak units being highly bioturbated, which reflects an, oxygen, an oxygenated environment. Figure A is a plot of TOC versus S1 plus S2. The plot shows that a few samples plot as fair source rock relative to TOC, but all the samples have poor source rock potential. The pseudo Van Crevlin diagram in figure B shows that the samples plot in the ranges of type three and type four kerogen. Therefore, the kerogen in the Pettit and Travis Peak units is probably woody material. The Pettit limestone in the Wright Mountain field is an oil producing reservoir with light oil, an API of 41 gravity. Its likely source of oil is the Pine Island shell above, which is a known source rock. However, it must have migrated from down dip where the Pine Island shell had entered the oil window. 80 samples were plotted to show the relationship between porosity and permeability. There is a good correlation between porosity and permeability. Overall, the Pettit limestone section has a poor reservoir quality with a mean porosity of 3.3% and a mean permeability of 0.95 millidarcy. The IHS Market Energy Database lists the right mountain field as a conventional type oil play. The oil has a high API gravity of 41, making it a light crude. This light API gravity aided production from a tight reservoir. So in conclusion, the Pettit limestone of the Wright Mountain Field in Eastern Smith County, Texas, can be characterized as three upward coarsening cycles. The two lower cycles were analyzed in this study to help characterize the section as an offshore complex. The Pettit B and Pettit C units show signs of shoaling up, but not necessarily into complete shoal water complexes with cross bedded with grainstones. The interpreted depositional model shows that the, P, the Pettit B and C units are just lateral of the shoal proper in a slightly deeper, lower energy setting, most likely towards the bottom of fair weather wave base where bottom waters and sediments are still well oxygenated. The bioturbation seen throughout the lithophages help, helps document a well oxygenated setting and lack of primary hydrological, hydrological features. Storm transport off the shoal complex is the most likely process for this resedimentation. Also, the strong mixture of ooids, microbial coated grains, and fragile thin shelled mollusk grains may suggest several sources of allochems intermixing during transport. The low organic content, less than 0.5% of the Pettit B and C units, is expected because of the abundant bioturbation indicating oxic conditions. The pore network is composed of interparticle and moldic pores with a mean porosity of 5.8% and a mean permeability of 2.4 millidarcy, the burrowed oolitic pack stone to grain stone has the best reservoir quality within the Pettit cycles investigated in this study. Actually, we can begin now. I apologize, I was running a stopwatch, but we're at 346. Um, so I just wanna remind everybody that you can get on Qualtrics on the uh, Masters uh, Saturday website and vote for your, your favorite talk. Uh, and just as a reminder that, that each talk is going to be 15 minutes in length. And if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. And at the end, uh, I will read them. Uh, at two, after two minutes is left in the talk, I'll reappear on the camera. Um, after the talk's over, we'll ask the questions. And if there's any more questions to be asked after that, we can stay a little bit after. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker. It's going to be Brooklyn Gase. Uh, and she's going to be introduced by her advisor, uh, Dr. Nathan Banks. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Brooklyn Ghost. Um, she's um, a native Texan. She grew up uh, west of San Antonio. And she started out um, an undergraduate at uh, Texas Christian University and then moved out of state to um, transferred to the University of Oregon where she got her, uh, her bachelor's of science. And um, then she came back to Texas um, to work with us here at UTIG. And she's been doing a a very um, unique and challenging project to try to um, do some kinematic modeling of a 3D seismic reflection data set that we acquired um, offshore of Costa Rica. And I think this is a pretty unique um, uh, effort to try to understand um, the kinematics of a subduction zone um, and, and 3D and looking at changes over time in structures. So I'll let her take it over and um, uh, and, and let's hear about um, what she has to say about her results from Costa Rica. Brooklyn. Hello, everyone. My name is Brooklyn Ghost, and I'm here to present my master's thesis. My research involved 
kinematic restoration of the Costa Rican convergent margin, exploring the erosional effects of a subducting sea floor. We'll begin by discussing subduction erosion. Here you can see a figure by Zoom and others illustrating a few possible mechanisms behind the process. Subduction erosion is defined as the loss of crust from an overriding tectonic plate due to subduction. Because the process removes the rock record, it can be difficult to examine. Half of all convergent margins are erosional. They are characterized by fast rates of subduction, low sedimentation of the trench, and subsidence of the margin. Half of all er, erosion can occur at the frontal prism or along the base of the upper plate due to mechanisms ranging from bod basal erosion due to strong coupling and hydrofracturing to localized erosion from subducting bathymetry. For the purposes of the study, we will be focusing on the latter mechanism by exploring how subducting features like seamounts and ridges affect the upper plate. The mechanics of seamount and ridge subduction have been modeled in both sandbox and forward modeling experiments. The lower left-hand figure shows the results of a ridge subduction sandbox experiment by Lelamond. As the ridge subducts, the margin is shortened and the seafloor is uplifted. The wedge thickens, resulting in a taper change, reactivation of pre-existing thrusts, and the retreat of the frontal part of the sand wedge. Another sandbox experiment by Dominguez and others, shown here, focuses on seamount subduction and shows that the seamount erodes the frontal prism before tunneling beneath the margin, at which point a bulge occurs on the upper seafloor accommodated by a prominent back thrust and a network of fractures. This figure on the left shows the results from a forward modeling experiment by Ra. It shows that the depth of the seafloor at different stages through the seamount subduction. The initial model geometry was set up to resemble the continental margin offshore Costa Rica. The subducting seamount was conical in shape with a base radius of nine kilometers and a peak height of two and a half kilometers. They found that vertical motion induced by the seamount is different for different parts of the wedge. 1,500 meters of uplift and subsidence occurred seaward of the shelf break, while 700 meters of uplift and subsidence occurred landward of the shelf break. This was enough to shallow the region to a depth of 100 meters. Costa Rica is an end member type erosional subduction zone and acts as a natural laboratory for studying these processes. The rate of subduction here is fast, 90 millimeters per year. There is low sediment input and the margin is exposed to rough subducting seafloor. Here you can see modern day bathymetry showing the Fisher Seamount Domain, the Kipos Plateau, and the Cocos Ridge. Stratigraphic studies by Vanucci and others have found that the region here has experienced a loss of 12 to 14 kilometers of upper plate material in the past 16 million years. They concluded that this degree of material loss and plate thinning cannot be explained without inciting subduction erosion as a mechanism for the removal of upper plate material. Von Heun and others have studied these features here as evidence of localized erosion caused by seamount subduction. They concluded that the seamount causes erosion of the frontal prism before tunneling under. They also imaged megalenses of material at the base of the upper plate that they associated with underplated material left behind by subducted seamounts. For this study, we will analyze the origins of a similar scarp-like feature within the study area. The location of the 3D seismic volume used for the study is shown in red. We will now take a closer look at the local bathymetry. Scarps and pockmarks in the slope to the northwest of the study area are comparable in size and shape to the feature within the seismic volume. This figure compares our feature's size with each scarp to demonstrate their similarities. You can see that they occur anywhere from 10 to 45 kilometers from the trench. Von Heun and others have agreed that there is a currently subducting seamount located just beneath this bulge here. This pattern of radial uplift is consistent with forward modeling and sandbox experiments. The figure on the right shows a zoomed in view or feature of focus. Here we have a long strike and up dip elevation profiles of the depression. It is nine kilometers wide and up to 400 meters deep at its deepest point. You can see a sharp lip around the rim in map view, observable as a steep 100 meter drop in the up dip profile. There's also intense channelization within the depression. Keep this feature in mind as we discuss major structural and stratigraphic features within the wedge itself. On the right, we have inline 2565, illustrating the stratigraphic relationships between the modeled surfaces and the erosional unconformities that bound them. On the left, we have a stratigraphic column showing three major groups of strata spanning 2.2 million years to present day. The groups are separated by erosional unconformities indicated by a red line. The lower group shown in blue is bound below by regional unconformity L1 and spans 2.2 million years ago to 1.8 million years ago. The middle group shown in green is bound below by the M1 local unconformity and spans the time from 1.8 to 1.3 million years ago. Finally, the upper group yellow is bound below by the U1 local unconformity and spans the time from 1.3 million years ago to present day. Here you can see the full view of inline 2565 from the seismic volume. 
The margin can be broken up into three major components, the frontal prism, the margin wedge, and the overlying slope sediments. Ages for the slope strata were obtained from this drill site, U U1413. Structurally, seven major fault blocks were identified. Another feature of interest is this region of chaotic reflectivity sitting here just beneath the shelf. The origin of this feature is unknown, but it's important to note that the depression of the seafloor lies directly above this feature. I will now give an overview of the methods used to examine the features of interest. Kinematic restoration is the geomechanical method of restoring a section to its original undeformed state. In the upper right hand corner, we have a simplified example of a 2D restoration that maintains bed length. The top shows the deformed section and the bottom the restored section. To accomplish this restoration, the unpinned edge is pulled to the right, extending the fold and flattening layers along the fault surface. Delta Z shows the amount of vertical motion that occurred, and Delta X provides a basis for calculating the degree of shortening. To perform a restoration in three dimensions, bed volumes must be maintained, and a solid model containing both structural and stratigraphic information must be built. Here's a short summary of the workflow. First, major strata within the seismic volume must be built must be picked and used to make a stratigraphic column that includes depositional information for each of the surfaces. Major faults are also picked as identified as reverse or normal faults. Next, the raw surfaces are modeled by the program using a user preferred amount of fit. A lot of errors can occur in this step since the program is abiding by geologic laws while attempting to create closed volumes of space for each fault block. This results in a solid model. Once the model is successfully sealed, bed volumes are calculated and a geologic grid is computed based on your desired resolution. This results in a coherent geologic model that contains valuable geologic and geometric information for performing the restoration. A kinematic mesh is built using the framework of the geologic grid and geomechanical properties are then applied to the material. This includes material properties such as density, Poisson ratio and Young's modulus. The pinned and unpinned edges of the model are also selected in this step. For this study, the landward edge was, was pinned. You can see here that once the constraints are set, the restoration can be performed, resulting in the geometry of the margin at each time step related to the deposition of each surface, shown here in 2D. To discuss these results in 3D, we will focus on the vertical axis of motion and how it varies in the XY plane. The model is shown in the top left-hand corner. Six locations were chosen to view the long strike differences in vertical motion of L1 for the slope, shelf break, and shelf. On the right, we have vertical motion curves showing northwest data points in blue and southeast data points in red. The model's paleo seafloor depth is marked with a dashed black line. We examine the vertical motion in terms of three phases of activity related to the lower, middle, and upper strata. Shown here are map views of the vertical motion that occurred throughout each of these phases. In both the difference maps and the vertical motion curves, phase one is dominated by dramatic subsidence, particularly of the shelf break. There is little variation in vertical motion along strike, as you can see in the difference map. At 2.2 million years ago, the margin is shown to be at or near sea level before experiencing up to one and a half kilometers of subsidence. This is also reflected in stratigraphic cores as L1 contains shallow water benthic forams and currently sits at abyssal depths. Phase two is characterized by uplift and subsidence with more three-dimensionality. You can see here concentrated uplift in the southeast corner of the modeled area, up to 600 meters of subsidence near the shelf break. And most importantly, we see a circular area on the shelf where little to no uplift occurs, flanked by two to 400 meters of subsidence. This region spatially correlates with the depression on the modern day sea floor. More recently, in the past 1.3 million years, we see enhanced subsidence in the same region of the shelf, despite uplift occurring in the Northwest. The distribution of subsidence reflects the geometry of the bathymetric depression. Here we'll look at the geometry of surfaces M1 and U1 to see how uh, basement source uplift could have affected these surfaces as well. You can see we have different maps showing the vertical motion of L1 and M1 during this time. The top left figure shows L1 at 1.8 million years in green and M1 in blue. And this will show you the surfacial geometry from one time step to the next. We see that uplift of L1 directly influenced the distribution of the M1 unconformity. For example, this region of L1 experienced 350 meters of uplift, spatially correlating with the seaward extent of M1. Most importantly, L1 shows uplift on the shelf that spatially correlates with the region of missing material in M1. You can see that here in the difference maps, but also in the superficial geometry. This confirms that basement source uplift contributed to the uplift and erosion of the M1 unconformity. Now let's look at the motion of L1 and U1 with a focus on the region around the modern day seafloor depression. 
you can see the vertical motion of L1 is reflected in U1. The spatial distribution matches well with the characteristic shape of the feature. This curve here shows vertical motion over the past 1.8 million years of a point outside of the feature compared to a point within. We see that the point within the feature is uplifted before subsiding at an enhanced rate in comparison to its surroundings. The concentrated subsidence manifested as a depression at around 1 million years. This shows that interactions with the basement at 1.8 million years ago continue to influence the margin and has since manifested as a circular area of enhanced subsidence on the shelf. This leads us to conclude that Costa Rica technonism has been highly influenced by the subduction of bathymetric features. First, the kilometer scale subaerial uplift and subsidence that occurred during phase one is attributed to subduction of a ridge. This is supported by regional stratigraphic studies and reflected in the geometries produced in the restored model. Second, the currently forming seafloor depression can be attributed to the long-term effects of a subducted seamount. This process is illustrated here. First, a subducted seamount removes material from the frontal prism leaving behind a scarp. As the seamount subducts further, it drags frontal prism material down with it, leaving a wake of slope failure trailing behind it. Subducted sediments will move with the seamount until they're eventually underplated. Whether it be partially or fully is not known. The underplated sediments will coincide with the characteristic pop-up structure that occurs along the surface, causing enough uplift of the shelf to endure superficial erosion of the bulge and the formation of a local unconformity. Once the seamount has passed, weak underplated sediments that are left behind are eroded by basal erosion over time, forming a region of enhanced subsidence on the seafloor and the formation of a depression. This reveals that seamount subduction can have million year, million year scale effects on a margin that can be made observable by utilizing kinematic restoration. I'd like to thank my advisor, Nathan Banks, for his guidance, the University of Texas at Austin for the opportunity to learn, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding my academic career. And thank you everyone for attending the talk. I'll take questions. Thank you again, Brooklyn. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move on to our last speaker. It's gonna be Sergio Leon Marquez. And I'd, I'd like to tell everyone again to remind everyone to go on to the Master Saturday website and go ahead and vote for your favorite talk on the Qualtrics poll. Uh, remember, it's gonna be a 15 minute talk. At any point, you can uh, ask a question through the question and answer at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, and if we don't have any time, don't have enough time, we can continue on and ask uh, questions afterwards. Um, and so, like I said, it's going to be uh, Sergio Leon Marquez, and he's going to be introduced by his advisor, uh, Dr. Attila Novoselic, and I'd like to turn it over to them now. Yeah, and I would like to add also that uh, Jim O'Connor is co-advising him. So, uh, again, uh, I, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sergio Leon uh, Marquez. Uh, he's uh, from Mexico City and uh, has been at UT for the last two and a half years. Uh, before that, he was at uh, Texas A&M when he got uh, a Bachelor's of Science degree in chemical engineering. Uh, so he, his work is on uh, energy use uh, of stadiums and uh, how to reduce carbon emission. And he's going to use uh, UT new Austin Soccer Stadium as a case study. Thank you. Sergio. All right, thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen now. Is everybody able to see it? All right, so um, hello, my name is Sergio and I'm gonna be presenting my thesis. The title is Selecting Green Strategies for New Stadiums. And as Dr. Novoselic mentioned, I did a case study of Austin FC. Uh, they are building a new stadium with capacity for 20,500 spectators. And uh, here's an overview of what we're going to cover today. So first I'll give a brief statement of the problem, followed by an overview of stadium energy use and carbon footprint. Then I'll go over the alternatives that I analyzed to reduce its carbon footprint. And finally, I'll present a summary of my results and conclusions. Uh, so here is a statement of the problem, and it has to do with thinking about how a stadium can act in order to reduce its carbon footprint. Now, uh, being a new stadium, there is no data available yet for energy use. So we had to make some projections based on the geometry of the stadium and the location, which is influence, which influences the climate. Now, uh, 
in, a, in a broader sense, the uh, relevance of this thesis is how to define measures that contribute for the commercial building sector. Uh, so they can determine their best strategy to uh, reduce their emissions associated with energy use. Uh, so in particular, this case study uh, is pursuing uh, leadership in energy and environmental design certification, which is a rating system designed by the US Green Building Council. Uh, you can see uh, on these tables, which are from their actual uh, scorecard, that the energy and atmosphere category has the most points available. And as they try to uh, increase their level of certification from the minimum required on their lease with the city of Austin of a silver level, uh, we are going to look into the uh, following subcategories, which have to do with the energy performance of the buildings, how to optimize it, and also considering uh, renewable energy alternatives. Uh, so on this slide, I'm showing a flow chart of how the carbon footprint was estimated. As I mentioned, we, uh, we did a model that allows us to estimate energy consumption and demand for, for uh, some uses. Uh, the primary, primary energy forms that stadiums use and buildings in general are electricity and natural gas. Uh, now we know that for electricity, the carbon intensity of generating it is expected to decline over the next decades. And uh, some other end uses such as space heating, which require natural gas are also considered. Um, so uh, here's the schematic of the model that was used. The, uh, the figure on the left is showing the enclosed spaces that were modeled. And in order to model them, I used uh, I decided to model uh, two main uses, which are heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and lighting. And in order to do that, I used a simulation tool developed by the Department of Energy, which allows users to retrieve data for a typical meteorological year. And uh, that includes variables such as exterior temperature and uh, solar irradiance, which are used with the building geometry inputs uh, in order to calculate energy use uh, by uh, calculating heat transfer uh, through uh, different mechanisms. Um, so for that, for the HVAC end use, I consider different heating and cooling configurations, which have different carbon footprints. And I also consider the flood lighting system of the stadium, which is used to illuminate the field for night games. And for that one, I looked at uh, technical specifications for the, um, lighting fixtures, which uh, we'll look into on the following slides. So first, we're gonna go over the building energy modeling that was performed. And uh, this pie chart represents annual energy consumption, which as you can see is a strong function of building area. And since the uh, north end building it's a three-story building, which has the largest area of conditioned spaces but within the stadium. We uh, model different system configurations for the HVAC system and uh, order them on the x-axis by their carbon emissions for one year and on the y-axis by the uh, energy cost. So um, the two options that are shown here were selected and modeled in further detail. Here you can see that the, there is a trade-off in terms of energy use and energy cost versus the carbon emissions. And that has to do with the um, heating configuration. Now, both of these options, which had the lowest energy consumption, were modeled using the same cooling ratio, uh, which uh, the same energy efficiency ratio for cooling. And uh, they, uh, that was based on the minimum efficiency standard, which is uh, defined by the American Society of Heating, Ventilation, and Air Conditioning Engineers, which is a benchmark for uh, commercial buildings, uh, standard 90.1. Uh, we also consider lighting, which as you can see, is a major fraction of uh, annual energy consumption. So within those two alternatives, one of them uses electricity. And on this chart, we can see the seasonality of electricity consumption and demand. 
uh, when we look at the cost of that profile, we can see that uh, when we compare it to the furnace heating option, which is powered by natural gas, it results in a larger annual expense for energy. And this can be attributed to the large demand charges, which occur uh, for the heat pump configuration during the winter uh, for, for space cooling. Now the MLS season takes place from March to October. So that cooling uh, load is more significant for the stadium. Uh, the heat pump electric option, however, does reduce emissions. And in order to do that, it requires uh, this amount of energy, which you can see for each building. That's the in instantaneous demand for power. Uh, rather than the accumulated energy consumption for, for the schedule that was studied. <sighs> On this slide, uh, I show the evolution of the carbon intensity of electricity. So I looked at Austin Energy's Climate uh, Protection Plan, which uh, has stated goals for, um, for uh, to increase the percentage of carbon-free generation resources. And I use those yearly projections and the annual energy consumption estimates to calculate the carbon footprint over a period for the stadium. Now they are scheduled to begin operations in March of 2021 and their original lease goes through 2040. Uh, but as you can see on the figure on the right, the electricity, uh, uh, the carbon footprint, the carbon intensity of electricity is expected to drop to zero by 2035. Therefore, we can see that the um, electric heat heating alternative would be more effective for reducing emissions after 2035. Uh, for the flood lighting system, I did a simple analysis which compared two different uh, lighting fixtures, uh, the one with 40% less uh, wattage results in savings, which are attributed to the man charges, since as long as the stadium uses them once a month, that the man for power is going to be reflected on their electricity bill. Now, uh, as the stadium uses more or less the flood lighting system, you can see within the profiles shown on the colored lines, which are basically representing use, just different ways of interpreting it. Uh, for example, for the baseline, uh, it shows that for a 300 operating baseline, you would have savings of 117 approximately due to uh, energy savings. And as I mentioned, the demand charges that are the baseline. Uh, on the next slide, I did an analysis of a proposed PV uh, solar carport, which would be on the Northeast parking lot. And due to its orientation of 20 to 20, 25, 225 degrees uh, relative to North measure clockwise. Uh, and um, I made an estimate using PV watts calculate, calculator to determine how much generation different system capacities could provide. Now the blue bars show the fraction of the annual energy consumption that is needed every month, as we saw on the seasonality uh, slide. And the colored cells represent the fraction that the uh, solar system, solar, gener solar PV system is able to provide. Uh, I did an economic analysis as well in order to determine the abatement cost estimate since the uh, renewable generation would be displacing um, the uh, electricity from the grid, which has a certain uh, carbon intensity until it declines. Now, uh, the um, revenue for the solar uh, energy production is based on Austin Energy's value of solar rate, which is about uh, 0 0.047 dollars per kilowatt hour generated and uh, and this is projected until 2050 which would be a 30 year period which also considers the degradation factor of the solar panels uh, the internal rate of return which sets the net present value of the investment to zero uh, has 
can be affected if the investment takes place in 2021 or 2022, since the investment tax credit for the upfront cost can uh, is scheduled to decline. Now, uh, I also model different discount rates for the economics, and I can see that the energy uh, rate would have to be increasing at uh, a similar uh, pace in order to keep the project neutral. Finally, we get to uh, the conclusion slide, which shows represented on the x-axis, the carbon footprint, which would be for this uh, three end uses, approximately 3,400 tons of carbon emissions throughout the 2021 to 2050 period. And the order in which alternatives are recommended is based on the emission abatement cost estimate, which is normalized by the potential to reduce emissions for each of these alternatives. So first we see the uh, flood lighting system, which uh, the 40% efficiency uh, low wattage lighting fixtures can reduce up to 140 of those of that total carbon footprint, followed by the solar photovoltaic system within uh, modular, uh, so um, within a modular scheme, since the space within the parking lot can be divided and uh, within a range of economic parameters like the discount rate and the original investment. And finally, we see that the heat pump electric heating would have the highest abatement cost when we divide it by how much emissions are actually displaced. And it's interesting to find that the, it would be more effective to do it uh, after the end of the stadium's original lease if they extend it they can extend it for up to three times uh, for 10 years. And since the electricity uh, would be carbon free by then, the, there would be more emissions displaced because this is relative to the furnace configuration. So uh, when we add up these three alternatives, we can see that the carbon footprint for those three end uses can be reduced down to 32%. And uh, that is, um, with that, I would like to thank the members of my committee for their help and support throughout this experience, the members of the EER program, uh, Energy and Earth Resources, and uh, members of Austin FC who helped me with this uh, project. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you. Anything further? No, nothing further. Thanks. That concludes our Master's Tuesday. Congratulations to all the students and thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you next semester. Thanks so much, Eric, for chairing as well. Okay. Thank you.